So good afternoon, everyone. This is Philip Griffiths, and it's a pleasure to introduce our speaker, the first of two in the mini course. Uh, the title is O Minimality and Hodge Theory, Definable Gaga and Griffiths Conjecture. Uh, Jacob Zimmerman is the, uh, will be giving both lectures, and Jacob, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a real pleasure to speak here. Um, I'm going to be basically picking up where uh, Bruno left off. There will be a little bit of repetition. Uh, but essentially, what I want to do uh, with this talk is talk about um, some developments in um, O minimal geometry and specifically in uh, the effort to link up O minimal geometry and complex analysis. Uh, and then applications towards uh, Hodge theory in particular, we'll be talking about a proof of the Griffiths conjecture that, that Bruno mentioned last time. So let me start out just by recalling some sort of background. Sorry. So um, the basic reason we care about Hodge structures is that if we have a smooth projective variety, we can define uh, several Hodge structures on it, one for each uh, degree. So if you look at the primitive cohomology inside the cohomology of X. Um, then you can get a polarization by looking at the, um, the cup product basically and the, um, the polarization form. We get a Hodge decomposition using the Dolbo uh, cohomology groups and we satisfy the key positivity and conjugation sort of properties. So that's the, the basic kind of object we wanna study is the Hodge structure of an algebraic variety and specifically how that varies um, in families. So if we fix a uh, vector space together with a uh, bilinear form on it, which you can think of as the primitive cohomology of some smooth projective variety with some form on it, then we can just let M be the moduli space of all polarized weight K hard structures on this vector space. So basically we're giving all possible Hodge filtrations in such a way that we get an extra Hodge structure. And then we wanna mod out by automorphisms of our integral structure. And that becomes the appropriate moduli space of uh, Hodge structure that we're looking at. And then if we have a smooth projective family that um, X moves in say, let's say the base here is Y, uh, then we obtain a period map a map from Y to this M. It's a complex analytic map. And what it does is it sends uh, a point to the hard structure of the fiber at that point. So given a point on the base, uh, we look at a fiber, we get a smooth projective variety that gives us a hard structure and that's that gives us this map. Um, and so uh, as Bruno mentioned last time, sort of uh, by now we know that there's a definable structure on M for the R and X O minimal structure. And this map is definable and that has all sorts of properties. I wanna just recall that um, even though we got this map phi from looking at a smooth projective family, the only real key property of phi that we are going to end up caring about is that phi is Griffiths transverse. It's a uh, differential condition and this is the condition that really allows us to control maps to M uh, from an analytic and algebraic point of view. And uh, going forward, when we talk about period maps, we don't need to assume that there's actually some smooth projective uh, family. We can just talk about complex analytic maps, which are also Griffiths transverse. So we can sort of abstract all that business away. Um, so the theorem due to, oh, I fixed this and then I fixed it back. Sorry, it's due to uh, Baker, Bruno Barb uh, and myself based on also joint work with Klingler um, is the following. So if you have a proper period map from an algebraic variety to this moduli space M, then um, in two, in, in, uh, sorry, informally, what the theorem says is that the image of the period map in M is algebraic. So how does one formalize that given that M itself is not algebraic. In fact, there's, there's work of Griffiths and others that says that most of the time it's sort of very far from being algebraic. So what we do is we say that this, this map phi here, we can factor it as uh, F composed, as I composed with F, iota composed with F, where F here 
is a dominant map onto uh, a quasi-projective variety, Z. So Z here is quasi-projective and F is dominant, meaning it's surjective and the corresponding map of, of structure sheaves is injective. And then the map from Z to M, which is now a map of complex analytic uh, varieties or spaces, um, is injective. Okay, so this is how you formalize saying that the image of phi here uh, is algebraic. So let me just say a, a couple of words about, um, about the, the properness adjective here. So it's it sort of, if you have a pure pe enough that's not proper, you can still say something is just kind of awkward because images under non-proper maps are hard to talk about in any category, essentially. Um, in, in, in this setting, if you look at pure maps, um, it, it, at period maps, it's not so bad because given any uh, smooth projective, any base basically in a map to M, you can always extend it to something where the map is proper. Uh, so the properness adjective here is not such a big restriction. If you were to remove it and replace the word algebraic with constructible and do some other things, you could sort of generalize the statement to non-proper period maps, but it's kind of awkward to talk about and that's why we, we include the word proper here. Okay, um, so how should you sort of think about this, this uh, projector and why it's maybe a little surprising is because essentially what it does is it talks about the analytic property on Y of points corresponding to the same hard structure, right? That's purely an analytic condition. Um, and it says that you can in fact parameterize equivalence classes of having the same hard structure using some algebraic parameter space. Um, another way to maybe think about this is um, if you look at the fiber product over M, so basically inside Y cross Y, we look at the relation of pairs of points that correspond to the same hard structure. Then in fact, showing that's algebraic um, is, is, is well, I guess classical by now, uh, it's, it's, it basically follows from Catani, Dali, and Kaplan. Uh, you can reframe the sort of Hodge low sign. Um, so in some sense, this image we're constructing is just the quotient by this relation. The difficulty of course, is that if you have, if you have a, even algebraic equivalence relations, quotients might not exist. The question of when a quotient exists seems to be quite hard. Um, so that's sort of the content of the theorem. Um, so some history, uh, Griffiths formulated this uh, conjecture and uh, he proved it in the case where Y is proper using some, so I, I don't wanna uh, oversimplify, but essentially the key ingredient is Kodaira's uh, existence theorem because and, and, uh, you have a sort of actual bundle, the Griffiths bundle, which you can show using differential geometry is a positive bundle. And then you have a positive bundle, uh, which is Kähler, and so you get, uh, you get a projective variety, a projective embedding. Uh, and then there was some further work. Uh, so Meze uh, proved the theorem uh, in the case where the image is smooth using some other methods I'm not gonna talk about. Okay, so let me uh, just clarify what this theorem breaks up into and then we'll, and then we'll go, uh, go into the theory behind it. So there's really two parts of this theorem. First of all, is just showing that the image is algebraic because a priori is just a complex uh, variety, complex space. And to show that it's algebraic, uh, we're going to develop an uh, O minimal geometry, which can handle deformation theory, because ultimately the argument uh, is going to be deformation theoretic. And so whatever O minimal theory we use, uh, it's not gonna be enough to, to do the stuff, um, to just sort of give definable spaces on the sets themselves, definable structures on the sets themselves, we're gonna to have to allow ourselves to talk about nilpotence. So we need to define some kind of geometric theory, which takes O minimality into account, but at the same time allows you to handle things like nilpotence so that we have a flexible, uh, a flexible enough theory to deformation theory. So that'll be um, algebraicity. And then in fact, the theorem is stronger. It says that the images uh, is quasi-projective and the quasi-projectivity I'm not gonna talk about uh, in this talk basically at all. But uh, what I want to mention is just that once you have the fact that the image is algebraic, um, then you just do sort of algebraic geometry using, you know, one of the key ingredients is Fujita's vanishing theorem. Uh, you do some induction argument, but the point is at that point, you completely forget O minimality. You just take this input that you have now that everything inside is algebraic um, and just algebraic geometry uh, is enough to prove that it's, that it's quasi-projective. Okay, so, 
that's kind of the uh, general setup for the talk. So what I want to do now is I want to start describing uh, this O minimal geometry that allows you to talk about uh, infinitesimals, about nilpotence, um, which we call definable analytic spaces. So let's start defining those. And we're going to be working in an arbitrary O minimal structure. So even though in the end for the application to Hodge theory, we're going to work with Rn exp, which at least for now seems to be the case whenever you apply this kind of thing to a number theory algebraic geometry. In principle, the entire theory works uh, for an arbitrary O minimal structure. So there's no harm developing it in that context. So just to recall some stuff that uh, Bruno said, um, a definable space for us is just gonna be a topological space together with a finite atlas uh, by definable sets with definable transition functions. So essentially you take finitely many definable sets in Rn, uh, you glue them together with definable transition functions, that's a definable space. Key in this, uh, in this theory, which you already see here, is that whenever we talk about any kind of atlas, it always has to consist of finitely many elements. That's, that's because you're ultimately doing logic here, um, you're not allowed infinite covers uh, in almost any situation. So you want this to be a finite atlas. Sorry, so now given such a thing, you get a definable site on X and this feels a bit technical, but it's gonna be very important when we talk about sheaves. So essentially uh, definable open sets are the objects which you might expect, uh, but now admissible coverings uh, have to be finite. So when we talk about sheaves on the definable side of X, they're going to assign something to every definable open set. And if you have a finite covering, then you have to satisfy the gluing condition. Uh, but if you don't have a finite covering, then you don't. So that's gonna be, that sort of makes life both uh, good and also difficult sometimes. So given a definable open set in uh, fine complex space in C to the N, you can look at the uh, structure sheaf O def, which basically takes a definable open set and it returns holomorphic functions on you, which just thought of as functions are also definable. So I wanna just emphasize this, there's no sort of a subtle condition between the definability and the holomorphicity, you just separately require them both. So like these functions have to be holomorphic one and also they have to be definable. And it's easy to see that this makes ODEF a sheaf. The gluing conditions are trivial because it's actually a sheaf of functions. Let's give you some kind of sheaf on C to the N, but we wanna do uh, more interesting things and just look at open sets in C to the N. So the basic object, which we call a basic definable analytic space is what you might expect. We start with some definable open U. We take a finitely generated ideal, which just means we fix finitely many global functions uh, and look at the ideal they span on U. Then their vanishing locus, we call X, that's gonna be some definable set because it's the uh, vanishing locus of definable, finitely many definable functions. It's gonna be an analytic, set because it's the vanishing locus of holomorphic functions. And so X will be our underlying definable space. And the sheaf we give on X is just the quotient, the definable structure sheaf modulo uh, I times uh, modulo I. So this definition looks innocuous, but a priori it's not clear the sheaf behaves very well um, at all. The idea being that when you sort of zoom in uh, and then glue back up, you might get things you didn't expect in the first place. So it's hard to, you have to sort of sheafify to make, implicitly here we're sheafifying this definition. That's how you take quotients. Um, and so a priori it's not clear this behaves in a reasonable sense. And so a definable analytic space, we can now fully define what it is as a pair uh, X where X is a definable space with this definable site. And then you have a sheaf of rings OX on the definable side of X, such that uh, you can break it up into, you have a finite covering uh, by basic definable analytic spaces. So you basically take the thing up here, uh, these basic definable analytic spaces, you take finitely many of them and you glue them up, that's a definable analytic space. Okay, so those are the objects we're going to be looking at. So here's the theorem that makes this geometry nice. And it's the same theorem that shows up in complex analytic geometry. 
Uh, this kind of allows you to talk about objects the way you might expect. Uh, is that if you take a definable analytic space, then the structure sheaf is what's called coherent. So in other words, if you take any surjection from a power of the structure sheaf to itself, then the kernel is locally finitely generated. In other words, if you take any finite set of functions uh, and you look at the relation sheaf between them, that's locally finitely generated. So let me again emphasize, I'm probably beating a dead horse here, but I wanna emphasize that this locally here now is locally in a stronger sense than uh, in the usual topological sense. What this means is locally for the definable site. In other words, there is a finite covering such that on uh, by u sub i such that every u sub i, the kernel is actually globally generated by some function. So you have, you can sort of partition it to finitely many pieces and on each piece specify some global relations such that if you zoom in more, you don't need to add anything. It's all generated by those global relations. All right, so I'm gonna, I'm not gonna give the proof, uh, but I'm just gonna say what goes into it. So it's sort of clearly enough to think about basic definable analytic spaces. And the key idea, which is already present in the work of Peter Zoe and Starchenko, um, is given uh, a basic definable analytic space X and say C to the N, what you do is you use definable cell decomposition in a clever way to obtain finite maps to lower dimensional basic definable analytic spaces. And then you use a definable wire stress operation theorem. Um, so that's like a very, very rough sketch, right? I'm not, really, I'm not almost telling you anything, but uh, in fact, the hardest part of all of this um, is topological, basically. The, the, uh, the holomorphic aspects are sort of pretty simple and you can, you can copy them from, from usual complex geometry. The hardest part is to obtain these nice projection maps and to obtain compatible cell decompositions, which allow you to, to make everything go through. Um, so these, are, these arguments are, uh, borrow a lot from the work of Peter Zoe and Starchenko, who sort of first talked about all minimal complex geometry, and they in fact prove a coherence theorem as well. Um, but their coherence theorem was a little bit weaker than what we're doing it, because they proved it only on stocks. So in other words, they proved uh, the same theorem, but with the locally replaced with like stock locally. Uh, whereas we're taking the theorem and upgrading it to, a, um, to locally for this definable site which in a sense requires more global geometry and that and sort of entails uh, more topology uh, in the proof. Okay, so this is the theorem which makes everything work. So uh, let me just list out some corollaries once you have this nice structural result. So first of all, once you have a coherence, you for free get um, a no Ethereum induction statement. So if you look at coherent sheaves, uh, and any increasing chain of coherent sheaves, then those eventually stabilize. One nice property, which is not clear to begin with, is that if you have a definable analytic set Y inside some definable analytic space X, then the vanishing sheaf is coherent, right? This is something which might seem intuitive, but a priori is not clear because it's possible that if you look at the vanishing function uh, defining Y on some open set, then if you zoom in more, you might sort of get more definable functions you haven't seen before. And this is saying that that's not the case. So in other words, you, this theory includes the ordinary theory of definable analytic sets. It doesn't, you're not forced to throw in more new potents than you would have otherwise wanted to throw in something like that. So specifically, if you have a definable analytic space, uh, you're within your right to talk about the reduced definable analytic subspace. Sorry, I say sub scheme here. I should, I should say subspace here. Um, you also get a new Stellensatz, uh, essentially for free from complex geometry once you have the definable or coherence theorem. In other words, if you have any uh, definable analytic set and you look at its uh, space and you look at its reduced subspace, then some power of its defining ideal is going to be zero. So you can think of this as like um, cell decomposition tells you that if you have a definable family, you have... Um, how to say, in definable families in general, maps of sets, finiteness implies uniform finiteness. If you have a definable map and your fibers are finite, there's a uniform bound for how finite they are. What this Nusterensatz tells you is you have a similar kind of uniformity for multiplicities. So if you have some sort of definable analytic space, uh, it vanishes to some multiplicity at every point. 
And in fact, that multiplicity is uniformly bounded. It can sort of grow to infinity as you look at different points. So that's key uh, for doing any kind of deformation theory like we're going to do. So I'm telling that's gonna be very important. Um, and so the way to think about this now, uh, and the way we actually started thinking about this is so classically you have um, algebraic geometry and you can analytify it, have this identification functor into complex analytic geometry. So given a scheme, you can look at the complex space, you can map sheaves and so forth. And now what we're doing is we're providing an uh, intermediate category of definable analytic geometry. And so now whenever you, whereas before you could just analytify, uh, what this proposes is you have the intermediate step where you analytify, but you also remember the definable structure for whatever O minimal structure you want to look at. And then if you want, you can forget the O minimal structure, you can forget the definable structure, and just look at the corresponding holomorphic structure, okay? And the, the sort of uh, philosophy is that a lot of the objects you care about, uh, specifically, let's say, in Hodge theory, whereas they're not algebraic, instead of looking at them all the way over here, you can look at them inside definable analytic geometry where things behave a little bit, uh, a little bit simpler. Okay, so let me talk about these two functors very briefly. Um, so given a definable analytic space, you can analytify it to get just an ordinary analytic space. And essentially what this is, is on basic definable analytic spaces, you just replace your definable analytic sheaf by just the analytic sheaf. Uh, and you know, given an ideal in the definable analytic category, you get an ideal in the analytic category by remembering the same functions. Uh, and so this is functorial and that's what gives you your functor. You get an induced functor on coherent sheaves uh, and that's faithful and exact, which by the way, again, is only true once you have the Oak coherence theorem. Uh, so this theorem kind of is secretly embedded inside every one of these properties that I'm saying. So specifically, if you have a coherent analytic sheaf, um, you can check it's vanishing uh, on stocks uh, at points, which uh, is not true for general definable sheaves precisely because the gluing axiom only holds for finite covers, not for arbitrary covers. You can give pretty easily specific examples of definable sheaves where this is false, but it's true for the coherent sheaves. Uh, and you have this nice property that uh, the, um, the local rings have the same completions. So it's kind of easy to pass from one to the other. Oh, Jacob? Yes. Sorry to interrupt, but this, this reminds me of a question I had, which is this local ring, so what is it? Does it have a sort of intelligent description? Oh, oh, the ring um, OXP? OXP. Hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so if you're in Rn or anything which contains Rn, um, then it's the same. It's just the holomorphic uh, local ring. Yeah. Because, you know, given any power series, it converges somewhere. So it over converges somewhere. And so it's going to be inside your thing. Um, but then for different O minimal structures, it's different. So given our alg, it's gonna be, you know, whatever, the hensilization of algebraic functions or whatever. Uh, and then for other O minimal structures, I don't know what it is. Okay, so, but so your local ring, you're still basically allowing like more or less arbitrarily small open sets containing it, right? There's no sort of global that, restriction coming from. Oh, sorry, yes, it's defined the same way where you just, you just take it directly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Over. There's something which I'm not mentioning here, which is usually mentioned when people are studying um, definable spaces. And that's that um, technically you have more stocks here than just those given by points. So what you can do is you can look at, uh, if you look at a theory of types, this was explained to me by Piers Gonsarchenko as well. Uh, you can sort of given any, so some types are closed points, but you have other types as well. So for example, if you look at like the um, open interval on the real line, mm -hmm. then um, what you can do is, um, what am I saying? Um, well, let me give the following example actually instead. Um, if you look at the, the complex line, so you have points and you can zoom into points. But the other kind of thing you can do is, for example, um, you can look at like the x-axis mm -hmm. and you can take the inverse limit of definable sets, which sort of are above the x-axis mm -hmm. and to the left of the point zero. And that gives you a direct limit you can take, which will also give you a local ring. Mm -hmm. 
And so essentially any, any type um, gives you another point at which you can take the stocks. And then for these extra points, then for any sheaf, you have like a stock local property where you vanish. Oh, okay. So you mm -hmm. can increase the number of stocks you look at in I order see. to recover the usual properties. And these stocks look very interesting. It doesn't seem to make anything easier because these, these stocks, these types are hard to classify and then they're hard to work with. Um, but they seem like a lot of fun to study. And as far as I know, no one studied them so oh, far. Yeah, very interesting. Thanks. No worries. Okay. Um, so that's the analytification functor. Now, similarly, and this is the one we're going to be more interested in, given a, a scheme of finite type or an analytic space, but let's stick to this case, uh, you can define um, the definabilization of it, which would be a definable analytic space. Uh, and the way you do this is, well, any scheme is locally, like locally in a finite sense, given by affine schemes. An affine scheme is just some idea in C to the N, so just think of that in a definable analytic category and you get your, definable, your basic definable analytic space. That's functorial, you can show it pretty easily. And so given any scheme of finite type, uh, you can get a definable analytic space in this way. This gives you a corresponding functor on sheaves, on coherent sheaves. So here's something important uh, that I wanna talk about, which is that um, this functor is not essentially surjective. So there are in fact, excuse me, definable coherent uh, sheaves, uh, which are not uh, algebraic. They don't come from algebraic coherent sheaves. So here's a simple example of a line bundle even. So you can look at the, first of all, C local system, which uh, on, on GM, which uh, essentially as you go around the loop, the monodromy is e to the two pi i alpha, where alpha is any not real number. You can make alpha real too, but let, we're gonna consider alpha not real. You can think of it as a definable C-local system because the gluing is pretty straightforward. You can show that's all definable. Uh, and then you can tensor that with the definable structure sheaf and this will give you a definable line bundle. It in fact trivializes with a cover with contain, consisting of two uh, sets. And it turns out this definable, it's not so easy to show, uh, though it's not super hard, that this definable line bundle is not trivial no matter which O minimal structure you're in. Um, however, it obviously can't come from something algebraic because algebraically GM has no non-trivial line bundle. They're all trivial. Uh, so this is an example showing you in fact have extra objects in the definable category that you don't see in the algebraic category. Okay, so with, oh, and um, yes, yeah, so this will be important later just because schemes are a pretty bad category to work with. Uh, you can extend all of the things we've been talking about to algebraic spaces as opposed to uh, algebraic schemes, basically because a tau descent works perfectly well in the definable category. In fact, what Bruno talked about that quotients exist uh, is sufficient to make this make sense. Uh, so this will be important later and I'll, and, I'll, and I'll point out where, but if algebraic spaces are unfamiliar, then you're, you're not losing much just by sticking to thinking about schemes. Okay. So then uh, we have the following strengthening of the, the definable Chow theorem by Peter Zill and Starchenko, which we're going to call definable Gaga. That's supposed to mirror usual Gaga, um, which says that if you look at this functor uh, for, of coherent sheaves, even though it's not essentially surjective, it's fully faithful and exact. And moreover, uh, the image is behaves pretty well. So if you look at the essential image, and you look at any sub-object or quotient that's still in the essential image. So somehow if you start, if you look at the uh, definable coherent sheaves, which are algebraic, you can play with them and not worry too much about leaving the algebraic category, even if you play with them on a definable analytic sense. However, uh, here is a warning uh, that in fact, the image is not closed under extensions. Uh, in, and we, we searched I don't know about far and wide, but we thought about this for a while and we can't think of any reasonable setting in which the image is closed under extensions. It just seems to rarely be the case. Okay, so, so one thing to, to point out is this is uh, similar to usual Gaga, except for as sort of always is the case in the, uh, the usual Gaga, you need properness, you need compactness. Whereas if you throw in O minimality, you don't. So, you know, O-minimality acts as sort of a substitute for compactness, which is one of the ways it was envisioned in the first place. All right, 
So let me very briefly sketch the proof just to um, just, just because I want to explain how um, the stuff I talked about earlier with OCA coherence on the that comes in. So first let's assume that X is reduced. And the very simple case is you have a algebraic vector bundle and inside it, you have an, uh, a definable vector sub bundle, uh, which we want to show is algebraic. So why is this true? Well, this is true because how do you, how do you specify a vector sub bundle? You just give a map to the Grassmannian basically in the definable category. So given the point, uh, you specify which point in the Grassmannian of your vector bundle you're mapping to. And now this is a case of just the usual child theorem. Uh, this is a map, a definable map between two algebraic varieties. Therefore, it's algebraic. And so that handles this case where you're just dealing with vector bundles. Now, in the general case, if things are only coherent, even now things aren't so bad because over some open set, you're in the above setting. Every coherent sheaf over an open set is a vector bundle. So fix some open U where the above thing happens and look, let Z be the complement. Then you can basically algebraize your guy over your open set and over the complement. And the whole issue is to glue these two together. So we're gonna let bold, I'm using script letters for definable objects and bold letters for um, algebraic objects. And then DEF is meant to be the definableization factor. So now what we do is, well, we have something um, over the open and we can look at its closure in F. This would be some other coherent sheaf now over all of X. And the idea is that it's only, they're only different now uh, over your closed Z. And by definable Nostellensatz, in fact, everything you're doing exists over some finite thickening of Z. And so now you can apply induction. So it's key to have Nostellensatz, right? If we were only, uh, if things only made sense over like Z, but you had to thicken more and more at different points, you couldn't actually apply induction. By Nostellensatz, you can in fact look at some fixed thickening of Z um, and so everything works, works well. So formally speaking, the way you do this is you intersect these two coherent sheaves you have. One is the definableization of the thing that you got. And the other is the sheaf you started with. You look at the quotient and now that's an actual definable coherent sheaf that's supported in some finite thickening. So now you've basically tracked your coherent, you, you've trapped your coherent sheaf between two algebraic sheaves. Uh, one is F and the other is this IK to the Z E tilde. And so now everything sort of exists on this quotient, which is supported in the lower dimensional thing. That was very fast. Uh, so I just want to emphasize this, uh, this point that you kind of fix things up on the open. And then by definable Nuschtelensatz, you only have to worry about some finite thickening of the complement. And so then you can do induction. Okay. Um, and then if you have a non-reduced space, you sort of filter in the usual way by powers of the uh, reduced ideal. And, and everything works uh, without much trouble. All right, that was a very fast sketch. So let me now uh, talk about some nice consequences of, um, of definable Gaga, which are really what we're gonna be interested in. So first of all, we have the stronger definable Chow, uh, which is basically the usual definable Chow, but now we're allowing new potent, we're allowing the scheme structure. So given any algebraic space, and a definable analytic subspace of its definableization, then in fact, it itself is a definableization of uh, an algebraic of a closed subspace, uh, taking into account all the non-reduced structure. So it's exactly usual chow, but with, with no potents. The second corollary, which, which makes uh, things quite nice, is that uh, definableization is fully faithful. So if you have maps between definableizations, um, then uh, in fact, they come from algebraic maps uh, in a unique way. And so one corollary of this is that if you have a definable analytic space, you can ask the question, is it algebraic? And this question uh, makes sense. If it has an answer, it has a unique answer. So unlike in the complex case where you have complex varieties or complex schemes, uh, but even varieties which admit algebraic structures in several different ways, and you kind of have to worry about what's the canonical one. If you specify a definable structure, then either you're not algebraic, in which case that's just, that's just life, or if you're algebraic, that algebraic structure is canonical. So you can talk about it in a canonical way. So it's kind of nice because you can 
Uh, whereas before, if you're just in the complex world, for Griffith's conjecture, you kind of had to ask the question, is the image algebraic in this kind of ad hoc way where you specify some intermediate thing? Now you can just straight up look at the image and ask, well, is this image, which is a definable analytic space, algebraic? Does it have an algebraic structure? If so, there's a unique one. Um, so that's kind of just linguistically nice. Um, so, so here are just some examples to remind you how uh, Gaga fails for the usual analytification functor, uh, which, I, which Jacob, I like can I ask a question? Yes, please. Uh, yeah, so you say it's, it's unique, but suppose you take two different uh, uh, ominimal structures. Uh huh. And you have uh, X, which is the same topological space, but with two different uh, incompatible ominimal structures and is definable for both. Oh, no, then, then it could have different algebraic structures. Yes, sure. But yeah, uh, do you have an example? I mean, is that? Yeah, I mean, you can look at the, I mean, look at the, look at any algebraic variety, look at any complex space with two different algebraic structures. So, okay, so, but uh, yeah, okay. In that sense, okay. I think that's the only kind of example. Yeah, yeah, have, right? is, yeah, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure, okay. Other questions? Okay. Um, so just to remind you how Gaga fails for the usual identification functor without the definable structure. So um, first of all, you have non-definable um, and non-algebraic automorphisms. So like uh, ZW goes to Z, they take a unipotent automorphism given in this way by a non-definable function. And this gives you different definable analytic structures on the same algebraic, on the same analytic space. Um, likewise for elliptic curves, um, you have lots of different RL structures on them. For example, you can descend the RL structure from C when you present it in the usual uniformization way. Um, and this would be a different structure uh, than the structure you get by definableizing its canonical algebraic structure. Um, and uh, as far as coherent sheaves are concerned, if you look at like the punctured plane, um, then it's got no um, line bundles for the RL structure, even though it's analytification, the stands of line bundles. And conversely, if you look at an affine curve of high genus, then it's analytification has no line bundles because it's Stein, but, um, but it itself has lots of line bundles, even ones coming from algebra. So the analytification functor, I don't know why I, maybe this isn't intuitive, but we, when we first did it, we were sort of hopeful that maybe you have the definabilization functor works well, and then also the analytification functor from the definable site works well. Uh, and you would have like descent theorems there, but, but you very much don't. So there's no Gaga from the, the from definable analytic geometry to analytic geometry, unless you include some kind of compactness, in which case you have usual Gaga. Okay, so let me now come to uh, the application to uh, Hodge theory. And in fact, we see now that um, the application has, has barely anything to do with, with um, Hodge theory at all, other than the fact that it has this definable structure under which period maps and are definable. So we're not gonna use any additional input uh, than that in the proof. But the general statement is the following. It's if you have any algebraic space uh, mapping into a definable analytic space in a definable way. So for me, the way I'm gonna write this is you have an algebraic space, you have this definableization and that map with some definable analytic space. If that map is proper, then its image is algebraic, right? So um, formally speaking, the same thing as before. You have some dominant algebraic map to some Z, uh, which then injects into your S uh, and this is all unique. Um, so this is, you can think of this perhaps as like um, a strengthening of uh, the Gaga statements. The Gaga statement says, if you have a map between the definableizations of two algebraic guys, that's algebraic. But this is only requiring the, uh, the source to be algebraic. The image can be whatever. The image can be any definable in the space whatsoever. And even so, any map into it has an algebraic image. Okay. So uh, first of all, and this is the only place where R and X shows up. 
this immediately implies the algebraicity of period maps because in that case, your period map is definable for the RNX structure. So you apply this theorem and you get the result. And secondly, here is where uh, the emphasis of algebraic spaces really pays off because this really has no chance of being true for, uh, for schemes because schemes aren't even closed under like finite group quotients. Uh, schemes are just a pretty bad category when it comes to things like that. Whereas if you take the definable analytic space, you can obviously take finite group quotients, you know, just cut and paste basically. It, it doesn't really care about things like that. So, so you need a category which at least can handle basic uh, cut and paste operations uh, and algebraic spaces are sort of the, the appropriate category to take. Um, so interestingly, even if you only care about the Griffiths conjecture, which, um, which in the end only involves schemes, because in the end, you're gonna show that your thing is in fact a quasi projective scheme. Uh, you have this intermediate space where you first show it's an algebra steps or intermediate step where you first show that the image is an algebraic space, and then you upgrade that using the Griffiths bundle and other arguments to show that it's in fact a scheme. Okay, so that's the algebraization theorem that I, uh, I'm gonna focus on for the rest of the talk. Uh, some more comments about it. So first of all, you have to be a little careful now. In the, before you had, uh, when you were dealing with reduced spaces, any period map was automatically well-behaved. Uh, somehow the differential geometry, then the negative curvature, as, as Bruno mentioned, uh, insists that, it's, that, that you don't have sort of crazy period maps. This is not true once you have non-reduced maps, once you have non-reduced uh, spaces. So there exists non-definable period maps if you have non-reduced spaces. For example, here's a very basic example. Look at like the, the modular curve even, and look at its um, trivial thickening. We just thicken by an epsilon globally, whose square is zero then it has a period map, which is a map to Y1 to its reduced space. Uh, and and um, what does that do? It takes a generator on Y1, T, and sends it to itself, plus some crazy holomorphic function, very non-definable function, let's say E to the T, times your, um, your epsilon, times your infinitesimal epsilon. So this is a period map, it's Griffith's transverse. In fact, in this case, being Griffith's transverse doesn't mean anything because why one's a Shimura variety. So everything is Griffith's transverse. Uh, its reduction is definable, but it itself is not definable. So it's not gonna behave well uh, at the cusps if you wanna include the infinitesimal structure. Um, so, uh, sorry. so the theorem is still true for uh, non-reduced spaces. I, in the theorem, I didn't, I didn't uh, require reducedness anywhere. Like the Griffith's uh, conjecture is still true, um, but you have to insist that, uh, that your period maps are definable. This is something which shows up anyways for mixed maps because it, when you get to the mixed case, I'll talk about tomorrow, you have to require admissibility. Otherwise you get crazy stuff going on, not non-well-behaved stuff. Uh, usually in the pure case, you don't have to worry about it, but if you're dealing with non-reduced bases, then you do. Uh, and it's not, it's not a big deal for geometric applications because if you have any sort of family, anything coming from geometry, it will show that all that stuff is definable. Uh, so, that, so that's not a problem. Uh, so one nice corollary of this uh, to algebraic geometry that I admit I know very little about. This is, this is purely my collaborators. Uh, but if you have any kind of uh, separated Lee Mumford stack and it has a quasi finite period map, some kind of almost Torelli theorem, uh, then the corresponding coarse moduli space is quasi projective. And a, a nice concrete example of this is you can just look at the moduli space of smooth complete um, intersections of basically arbitrary degrees those all have natural uh, period maps coming from the cohomology. And so as a corollary, we can show that all of these are quasi-projective. All right. So here is, um, I'm going towards the end of the, we're towards the end of the talk now. I'm going to get a little bit more technical uh, than perhaps I should, uh, but I want to sort of, I want to present this because it sort of shows everything comes together. Um, here is the key proposition which makes everything work. Uh, the key proposition is really about square zero extensions. So we're coming back to deformation theory, which I pointed out was like the impetus for all of this. So the setup is you have some algebraic map, W to Z. You have a thickening of the top guy to W prime, an algebraic thickening. And you have a definable thickening of the bottom guy 
uh, and the map extends. So you have basically a definable thickening with an algebraic source and that's square zero thickenings. Everything is proper and dominant here. So W is some kind of cover of Z. Um, then the following uh, exists. In fact, the image of W prime is some algebraic thing Z double prime and you can factor it this way. So this is basically, um, this is basically a, uh, a simple case of the main algebraization theorem where we're just dealing with square zero extension, this very specific setup. Okay. So I want to do two things now. First, I want to explain um, how this proposition allows you to prove the main algebraization theorem. And then I want to explain how the work we did with Oka coherence and Gaga allows you to prove this proposition. So it, I'm sort of, I sort of want to uh, explain where the pieces fit a little bit. Um, yeah, and you have um, analytic counterexamples coming from something like this, where you have um, uh, Z prime and uh, so Z and W are both just like the affine line, and then they're both trivial thickenings, but this map you have has the sine T factor. And sine T has infinitely many zeros. So somehow a discrete infinity of zeros. And so you can't take care of all of them at once in some algebraic way. Whereas in the definable category, this would not be allowed. Okay, so I don't wanna stop and think through this too much, honestly, because it confuses me, uh, but I wanted to point it out. All right, um, so here is how the proposition implies the theorem. And this is uh, kind of the, the main framework for the theory uh, in the first place. So um, recall we have some sort of map between the, the definableization of an algebraic thing X and a definable thing S. Uh, so first of all, by standard arguments that I don't wanna go, I'm gonna go into, uh, we're gonna reduce the case of a proper modification. So this is some usual Hilbert scheme thing uh, that's quite standard. Um, but essentially we're gonna reduce to the case where F is surjective. And in fact, it's a, uh, an isomorphism over some open set in S. So essentially, this is some sort of contraction map where over an open set, nothing happens. And then over some close, you sort of contract down, maybe, maybe lowering dimensions and stuff like that. And so we're gonna let Z, which is something definable, uh, be the stuff in S, uh, the locus in S where weird stuff happens, where you don't have an isomorphism. So by induction, if you just look at the set Z itself, uh, then, uh, it's mapped onto by some algebraic thing upstairs in a surjective way. So Z's algebraic. We know that the reduced subscheme Z is algebraic. So all we have to do now is we have to glue the algebraic structure Z to the algebraic structure on U in such a way that, that makes the whole thing algebraic and recovers S, recovers the definable structure on S. But to sort of to zeroth order, just in the reduced space, we know everything is good just by induction. Um, so now the point is in order to glue, we're gonna start extending the algebraic structure to infinitesimal neighborhoods. And the square zero proposition is exactly the proposition which allows us to extend the algebraic structure to infinitesimal neighborhoods. It says, if we look at the kth infinitesimal neighborhood upstairs, its image is also algebraic. And so that gives us some infinitesimal thickening of our reduced space Z. And so basically we can algebraize this in the formal neighborhood and then Artin, which just, who just works in the category of proper maps and complex geometry, tells you this is enough. It tells you if you can algebraize infinitesimally to any order, then in fact, you can algebraize the entire map. Okay. So this in fact, steps one, two, and four all make sense without any definable analytic geometry. It's only step three, which needs definable analytic geometry to make sense because you have to talk about neopotence. Okay, so that's how the position implies the theorem. Uh, and now very, very briefly, uh, let me talk about the proof of the proposition. Um, so recall we have some W maps to Z and we have some thickening W prime. So the first step is just using algebra. You can show that uh, if you push forward the sheaf on W prime, you get some thickening of Z. And then if you look at Z, you now have a map of uh, structure sheaves, uh, which you know is uh, algebraic by definable Gaga. And then you quotient out by it and that gives you the proof. So essentially you have your algebraic thing here. 
you have it mapping to some definable thing over here, which is given by this thickening Z prime. But by definable Gaga, the kernel is going to be algebraic. And so everything can live inside the algebraic world. OK, so that's, um, that's how everything sort of comes together. So I just want to end uh, with a couple of, uh, with one, I guess, comment and one question. So first of all, one comment is that uh, we have this really nice theory of, of geometry now in the O minimal complex world. Um, what we'd like to do is define the coherent cohomology theory, and we just don't know how to do this. So there's a lot of work by um, Edmundo and his collaborators who abstractly develop cohomology for O minimal spaces. Um, and they have the six functor formalism working, and they can recover Betty cohomology, so Z coefficients or Rs, any constant coefficients using their theory uh, with O minimal cohomology. That all works really well. So the formalism of cohomology works fine. But if you look at these coherent cohomology groups, they just end up being too big. In any case, we look at they end up being infinite dimensional. Um, this is actually related to what I said earlier, where I said that um, if you look at the definable, the essential image of the definableization functor in definable Gaga, that's not closed under extensions. Extensions are exactly given by coherent, definable coherent cohomology of coherent sheaves. If you want to extend O by O, you get an H1O class, basically. Um, and because those are, are very infinite dimensional, you don't really get a good theory. So we don't, we, we basically have no idea uh, what, what to do here, but it seems like an interesting problem to come up with a, a well-behaved theory. Uh, so here's a, a question that I think, uh, I don't understand the exact relation, but it seems fundamental to this whole story. Um, and it's the question of how should one think of torsors in this category? Can they be defined analytically locally um, or do they have to be defined definably locally? So here's the kind of question that I think would um, shed some light on what's going on. So here's the notion of a torsor. Let's say we have some space X, even think of the complex line. And let's say we have um, a definable family over X, so some T mapping to X, which is a torsor for the definable group scheme GA over X. A torsor in what sense? In the sense there's some map from um, C cross T to T, uh, C cross over X, I'm sorry, it should be an over X of T to T. So we know how to add definable functions to T in a way which makes T um, a torsor pointwise for the complex action. Then the question is, do you actually get more objects this way or is this literally the same thing as a torsor in the definable analytic category? Which would mean what? It would mean there's some definable cover, some finite definable cover of the base over which your T actually trivializes. In other words, your T actually has sections over some definable cover which allow it to be trivialized. Um, so this is, uh, I think it's an interesting question abstractly, but this also came up, literally came up for us when studying the mixed uh, setting, as I'll explain tomorrow, in the mixed setting, there is a concrete example of a uh, of a torsor in this sense, in the pointwise sense, which we don't know can be definably trivialized. This is something that we actually had to fight against, and we ended up circumnavigating. Uh, but it but it legit comes up, and I think it's uh, kind of interesting to uh, to understand. All right, that's that's all I had. So uh, I'll stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. So thank you, Jacob. I think uh, if uh, there are any questions or comments. Uh, maybe I'll ask a question. Uh, do you know what the definable Picard group is of GM of, of C minus the origin? Well, it, it's very big. Um, so even, even, I mean, you're right. I talked about coherent cohomology, but H1 of things like O star is also very, very big. Uh, so we don't have a reasonable hand. We just like spent enough time studying it to understand that it's much larger than we can just, than we can deal with. Uh, but no, I don't have any concrete. Answer. I just know it's infinite dimensional, even for like a disk or C minus the origin or stuff like that. Oh, so you don't know that the things that are coming from the local systems give you every give you every line. No, no. And again, not even for the punctured disk, just for an actual disk or all yeah. of C. Even there, you have definable line bundles. Oh, okay, okay. Yes, you can give like 
coverings and then on the intersection specify things which can't be definably trivialized, even though of course they can be analytically trivialized. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah thanks. And can I ask a question? So this, um, this correspondence between the algebraic and the definable, you mm -hmm. say it's not essentially subjective. Mm -hmm. And we saw some results where you can uh, recover algebraicity inside of a uh, algebraic object. Uh, but are there some problems that you can translate into some uh, coherent shift in the definable sense that are not algebraic, that are interesting problems? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. Um, well, so, sorry. In a sense, no, I don't have any super ready for uh, right now. But, um, but in fact, um, if you look at the uh, Brosnan and Pierce, so again, I, I, I mainly, the main problem in answering your question is that um, even though definable analytic spaces that aren't algebraic sort of exist or whatever, they're interesting, the only real examples I have are from Hodge theory. Uh, so all of my answers are gonna be sort of grounded in Hodge theory. In the Hodge theory world, Pearson and the, uh, Prosten and Brosnan have a result where they show, that I'll talk about tomorrow again, where they show a certain line bundle as algebraic. And uh, you can actually prove that, you can give a slightly different proof using uh, coherent, definable coherent cohomology. So it turns out, there's an interesting property where you have, um, how to say, line bundles on varieties on the complement of a divisor automatically extend. Whereas in the algebraic world, if you have smooth, if everything is smooth and log smooth and such, whereas in the definable world, that's not true. There's a certain obstruction in H2Z. Um, and so one can actually interpret several, you can have, you get all sorts of interesting questions about H2Z classes on boundary components by studying things like that, just for uh, understanding extensions of various definable line bundles. That's the best answer I have right now. Um, Otherwise, I'm not sure. I mean, we've been, like I said, we've been focusing on trying to make a good cohomology theory. So because the R in principle is so big, we've sort of avoided studying them in too much detail. When you say H2Z, you mean it in the definable sense or in the standard sense? In the usual Betty sense, it's the same, yeah. In the, in the so usual so Betty is there, sense. Is there an exponential sequence there? Like, That's right. So there's an exponential sequence which comes In the out. definable world. <laughs> what, so the, the, the exponential sequence is not in the definable world. Uh, but but it gives you the abstraction from the definable world, sort of to extending. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank. You. Jacob, in the statement of the theorem at the beginning, uh, your I think it was script M. Are you assuming the monodromy is? Uh, are you factoring by an arithmetic group, or does that? enter in at all, whether monodromy is an arithmetic group or not. So um, the, the result, the, the proof does assume the, I mean, we're mapping to a quotient by an arithmetic group uh, to get the algebraicity because otherwise you don't have a definable structure. Uh, but from that, you can formally deduce, and we, we explained this, that if you want the image in just the quotient by the full monodromy of the, uh, of the algebraic or of the variation, that's also algebraic. The, the, the idea is that if you look at um, so this whole business about some people quotient out by just the image of the monodromy of the variation, and sometimes you can quotient by the risky closure as well. So if you quotient out by the, the risky closure of the monodromy, you get a nice fundamental set, fundamental domain. If you quotient out by the full image, uh, you get a much bigger fundamental set, but it can be covered by your fundamental sets from before. And then if you look at the image of your variety to a fundamental domain, it's gonna lie in only finitely many translates. So even though the quotient by the full monodromy is, uh, is not um, definable, doesn't have this nice definable sense, the image sits inside a definable piece of it. So in fact, it'll already show up in one of these arithmetic quotients. Uh, and so it follows formally that you get this algebraic thing. But, but we, our paper is written in the context of quotienting by arithmetic groups. Okay, so Siegel sets are somehow lurking uh, in the background somewhere. Yeah, I mean, in this, you know, this entire talk hid the actual definable structure on M, 
which uh, Bruno talked about, and that comes completely from Ziegel sets. Yeah. So, yeah, essentially, you know, M is like some symmet some space mod GZ. That's the image of some GR mod GZ. And we basically take a Ziegel set on GR and we push that forward to get our fundamental domain. It's almost exactly what happens. So Ziegel sets are very much front and center in the picture. Okay, any other questions or comments? If not, uh, I'd like to thank Jacob. Your second talk will be tomorrow and uh, maybe uh, we will look forward to it then. Thank you. Thanks.